Hi. Today, I'm going to share some chemical bonding test type questions with you. You could use them either as a test or as a study guide to make sure that you're prepared for an in-class test that your teacher is going to give you. Um, at the top of each slide, there's going to be a title. So if you find that you struggle with any of the questions, you should go back in my bonding playlist to find this video to help clear some things up for you. Um, and that's it. Let's roll. Okay, here is the first set of questions, which is on ionic bonding. So you should be able to answer these questions. Looking at a chemical formula, you should be able to know if it's an ionic compound or if it is a salt. That's what we call an ionic compound. Um, and you're going to tell that by knowing that you have a metal bonded to a non-metal. Metals, remember, come from the left side of the periodic table and non-metals come from the right side. In order to draw a Lewis structure for magnesium chloride, you would have magnesium with a plus two charge in the center between two chlorines, each with uh, eight valence electrons now, because magnesium is going to give one electron to each chlorine. So chlorine started with seven and now has eight because each chlorine has gained one electron. Instead of having seven, it'll have eight. Magnesium is going to be drawn with no dots because it has now an empty valence shell. It has emptied its valence shell to give electrons to chlorine. You could also draw this orientation vertically. So you could have a chlorine, a magnesium, and then another chlorine. But for the sake of space, many of us are just going to write it left to right. The properties of ionic compounds are that they have very high melting points. They form a brittle crystal lattice, meaning that if you break it, it shatters. Um, most of the time they will dissolve in water, and if they do dissolve in water, they will form electrolytes. They will also form electrolytes if they are molten, which is the term that we use to describe uh, ionic salts in the liquid phase because they are crazy hot because their melting point is really high. Now moving on to reading chemical formulas, the first question, what is the difference between a coefficient and a subscript? And then you are asked to count the atoms in, uh, of each element in these chemical formulas. So a coefficient is the number that goes out in front of a chemical formula, and it will tell you the number of molecules that are present. And then a subscript is the tiny number that is written under subscript, written below. Um, and that is going to tell you the number of atoms you have of that particular element in your chemical formula. So looking down here, we have the compound ammonium sulfide, which is the only ionic compound. Well, I shouldn't say only ionic compound. Ammonium NH4 is the only time you're going to have ionic compounds that do not have a metal in them. NH4 is a positive ion. It has a plus one charge. Um, so if I look at this, I have just two nitrogen atoms here because the parentheses, I have uh, two of everything in the parentheses. So that gives me two nitrogens. Two times the four gives me eight hydrogens and there's no subscript behind the sulfur. So it only has one atom. Then in magnesium phosphate, we have nine magnesiums because we have this three out front. That's the coefficient and it will apply to all of the atoms in that compound. So three times three is going to give us the nine magnesiums. Three times two times the imaginary one behind the phosphorus is going to give us six atoms of phosphorus. And then three times two times the four is going to give us 24 oxygen atoms. Lastly, we have iron three sulfite and we have this two out front, which is going to indicate that we have a two for everything, giving us four irons, which is the Fe, two times two is four. Then we have two times three times the imaginary one behind the sulfur, giving us six in total on sulfur. And then we have oxygen, two times three is six. Multiply that by this other tiny three behind the oxygen inside the parentheses. And that is going to give us a total of 18 oxygens. Using the crisscross rule, predict the formula for the following elements bonding to each other. Using the periodic table, you should be able to predict charges for all of these elements based on their group number. So because magnesium is a member of group two, that means it has two valence electrons that it's looking to lose, and it will be left with a plus two charge. 
Sulfur is in group 16 with six valence electrons and will be looking to gain two electrons and will have a minus two charge. When we crisscross those two charges, we will have Mg2S2. But we, in ionic compounds, when we crisscross, if we have the ability to reduce our subscripts, we're supposed to. And what's going to happen is really that magnesium is going to give two electrons to the same sulfur atom. So it's only going to take one of each. So that's what happens there. Um, lithium and fluorine each have a charge of one. So we don't write any subscripts there. They're just imaginary ones. Calcium and oxygen are a lot like magnesium and sulfur with a plus two and a minus two charge, which will be reduced. The reason that happens is because magnesium and calcium are in the same group and sulfur and oxygen are in the same group on the periodic table. So their bonding pattern is going to be really close. Then we have K and N. K has a plus one and nitrogen has a minus three. Crisscross those to get K3N. Aluminum and sulfur. Aluminum is in group 13, always with a plus three charge. Sulfur is in 16, always with a minus two charge. Crisscross those. Al23 is what you would get. Strontium and nitrogen is a two and a three. Crisscross, you get a three and a two. No reducing needed. Then we have potassium and phosphorus, which again, if you look at the periodic table, nitrogen and phosphorus are in the same periodic table group. And because they're both bonding to a group one element, which happens to be the same element, their bonding pattern is going to look pretty similar. So we would get K3P for that. And then beryllium and chlorine is a little interesting um, because beryllium is a member of group two, but it doesn't often bond. Um, it will be looking to lose those two electrons, so it can look like helium, and we would be left with BeCl2 because chlorine always has a minus one charge. For these compounds, you should be uncrisscrossing to figure out what the original charge was of the transition metal before it bonded in this compound. Transition metals are different from other metal metals on the periodic table because they can change their oxidation states or their charges. And really what that means is that they rearrange their internal electrons to change the number of valence electrons so that they can bond with different charges. Um, so copper is one of those examples. Copper sometimes is plus one and other times it's plus two. So you have to uncrisscross to figure out exactly which version of copper is bonding here. So this two had come from up here and there's an imaginary one behind the copper, which comes from the chlorine with a minus one charge that matches what we would predict for chlorine. So we can just take that for what it is and give copper the plus two charge. Here we have tin bonded to oxygen, but if you were to uncrisscross from both sides, there's an imaginary one behind the tin, which makes oxygen looks like it had a minus one charge. Oxygen will never take a minus one charge because then it would only have seven valence electrons and that's not the full eight. So when we uncrisscross it and find that oxygen had a minus one charge, at that point we have to realize that oxygen had been reduced um, and you can't reduce one and not the other. So if oxygen was reduced, should be a two, but was reduced to a one, it was cut in half. Meaning that this two, when it uncrisscrosses, was cut in half from whatever tin's charge was. So tin in this case is going to be plus four. Manganese and oxygen is kind of a similar situation. Um, they both look like they had a charge of plus one and minus one. Manganese, you may or may not know, it doesn't take on a plus one charge, but oxygen definitely will never take on a plus one charge. Oxygen will always be minus two because it's got to gain those two valence electrons. Um, so knowing that they had the same coefficient and ox, I'm sorry, the same charge or the same like number, um, not the same charge necessarily because manganese is a metal, so it'll always be positive and oxygen is a non-metal, so it'll always be negative. Um, knowing that they had the same number and oxygen is minus two, manganese would have to be plus two. And then lastly, we have silver and sulfur. So the sulfur has a minus two when you uncrisscross it, which is exactly what we would predict from a group 16 element. So um, the imaginary one that is behind sulfur right here 
is fair game and a really good assumption for what silver was before it crisscrossed. So plus one is perfect. And again, remember, these are all metals and metals are going to gain, I'm sorry, they're going to lose electrons when they bond. So they'll always have a positive charge. They're kicking out negative electrons. So they're going to become more positive. So all metals are going to have a plus something charge. Next up is polyatomic ions, and the question is, what is a polyatomic ion? And then do some crisscrossing with these polys to figure out what the chemical formula would be. I like to describe a polyatomic ion as a bundle of atoms that works together and carries a charge. Then we have our crisscrossing. Um, the important thing here is knowing when and when not to use parentheses. Um, here we have tin with a plus four bonding with a phosphate. I did not tell you the charge on purpose. It has a minus three charge, so you would crisscross the three and the four. Uh, the phosphate has to go in parentheses because you have four phosphate ions, um, and also you don't want it to look like you have 44 oxygens because that would be crazy. Um, next, we have aluminum and acetate. So the acetate ion has a minus one charge. And then aluminum has a plus three. So again, you would need parentheses to hold the acetate ion together. Next up, we have ammonium bonding with chlorine. And again, this is going to be an ionic compound that does not have a metal. And that's because the ammonium ion itself is positive. Um, they both have a one charge. Ammonium is plus one and chlorine is minus one. So they crisscross. And at that rate, there's no need for parentheses. And then last up, we have sodium and nitrate. Sodium has a plus one charge and nitrate has a minus one charge. So when you crisscross those, again, there's no need for parentheses. All right, here we have some ionic naming questions. So the first is how do you know when you need a Roman numeral for naming? And then secondly, we have a group of formulas that we need names for. And then last, we have a group of names that we need formulas for. You will need a Roman numeral anytime a transition metal is bonding in your compound, and that is going to tell you the literal charge of that transition metal. Um, and that's because the transition metals are weird and they can change the number of valence electrons they have so they can adjust um, their bonding patterns, really. So um, AGBR would be silver bromide. Silver is technically in the group with all the transition metals, but it'll only ever be plus one. It's kind of a weird exception to the transition metals rule. So um, if I were your teacher, I would not put silver on the test. Um, but I wanted to give it to you here because this is kind of a study guide. It's a practice for your test. Um, so Technically, silver doesn't need a plus, it doesn't need a, a Roman numeral of one because it's only ever plus one. The same thing applies to zinc, it's always plus two. Um, but your teacher may require it because you're still learning and it's a transition metal and all the transition metals get a Roman numeral. Um, but like the, the professional chemists don't need the Roman numeral because we have enough practice to know that it's always plus one. So that one, you may or may not find it in a Google search and your teacher may or may not want you to know that as the rule. I would confer with your teacher on that one. Then we have um, chromium bonding to carbonate and carbonate is a poly. So we're not going to rename it because it's just in an ionic compound. Chromium is a transition metal. So I have to uncrisscross to figure out what its charge was. Um, and this three here came from the chromium, indicating that it's chromium three. Then we have potassium oxalate. Um, oxalate has a minus two charge, which goes right here on the crisscross. And then potassium had a plus one charge, which would have been here, but we don't write imaginary ones. We don't have to worry about a Roman numeral because potassium is a group one metal. And it's a poly in an ionic compound, so we don't rename it. Potassium oxalate is it. Then we have strontium phosphide. Strontium is a group two metal, so again, no need for a Roman numeral. And phosphide is the name of phosphorus when it bonds. I like going from name to formula way better than formula to name because it tells you exactly what you need. So manganese four, crisscrossing with oxide, which is the bonded name for oxygen, 
would give you MN204, which you would then have to reduce to MnO2. Copper 2 sulfate, sulfate, eights and eights are polys. Um, they're not the only polys, but pretty much they'll be polys. So um, copper 2 tells you copper is bonding with a plus 2, and sulfate SO4 has a minus 2 charge. Crisscross those, and your 2s cancel on the crisscross. So you're just left with CuSO4. Potassium chlorate is a group one metal and chlorate is a poly with a minus one charge, crisscross, no problems. And calcium chloride, chloride is the element, chlorate is the poly. Um, kind of the same with this phosphide and an earlier in the video phosphate, phosphide, IDE is the element and an eight is a poly. So here we have calcium chloride. Calcium is a group two, no need for a Roman numeral. So the name makes sense. Um, and then you just crisscross it. Now, something I should point out, if you still are not totally comfortable on names and symbols, if you know how to use the periodic table to your advantage, you can figure it out. So um, we have a few elements here. We have chromium, copper, and calcium. All of those symbols are gonna start with C and maybe you're scrambled on them. Um, calcium chloride doesn't have a Roman numeral. So if you know your naming rules, you know that the symbol for calcium cannot be in the middle with all of your transition metals. You would know that it was somewhere in the skinny tower. And then from there, you might be able to place that it's calcium instead of cesium. Chromium and copper are going to be a little bit tougher because they both start with C. And even in that row, in that section of the periodic table, you have three elements that start with C. But at least you could narrow it down a little bit knowing that you have a Roman numeral, it's going to tell you exactly where to look on the periodic table. So that could be helpful. Also, if you know that ides represent elements and eights and ites represent polys, you can also use that to your advantage when it comes to naming. For instance, um, like this sulfate and sulfide, put that together and you can piece that you're working with either an element or a poly. Um, and then Use your knowledge of the periodic table to help you with that. Moving now into covalent bonding, looking at a formula, how do you know that you have a covalent or a molecular compound? How would you draw the Lewis structure for CO2? And then what are the properties of molecular compounds? Covalent compounds are going to be non-metals bonded together, which you would see in your chemical formula. Your elements would all come from the right side of the periodic table. Just don't forget hydrogen because hydrogen hangs out on the left side of the periodic table, but really is a non-metal. Um, and then covalent compounds or molecular compounds, the proper name for them, they are going to share their electrons. The Lewis structure for CO2 would look like this, where we have some lone pairs or leftover electrons on oxygen. And then this here is a double bond two electrons from each atom are in the double bond. So four in total, two from each atom. The properties of covalent compounds are that they have low melting points. They can often be found in the gas phase. If they're in the solid phase, they're typically brittle and they're also non-conductive. Moving on to covalent naming, we have uh, four formulas that need names and four names that need formulas. When it comes to naming covalent compounds, all you have to do is count the number of atoms in the chemical formula. Um, so tricarbon indicates you have three carbons, and then tetraphosphide would be for phosphoruses. It's important to note that when you have a binary covalent compound, the first element does not have a name change. You just stick a prefix on the front. And then the second element is always going to get a prefix, and its name is going to change to ide. So we have dibromine monoxide, carbon tetrachloride, and then lastly, diphosphorus pentoxide, indicating two phosphorus atoms and five oxygen atoms. And then on the other side, we have nitrogen monoxide. I specifically put this here because anytime you have just one of the first element, it does not get a prefix. So it's nitrogen monoxide. Same thing on the sulfur hexabromide, that's SBr6. 
dinitrogen pentoxide indicates two nitrogens and five oxygen atoms. And then last up, we have triarsenic pentaphosphide, AS3P5. Important to note is that anytime you have a prefix in your name um, of your compound, that indicates that you are going to automatically have covalent bonding. There are no prefixes in ionic bonding, and there are no Roman numerals in covalent bonding. So by looking at a name, um, even without knowing the formula, you should be able to piece together if you have um, ionic or covalent bonds. Next up is just drawing some Lewis structures. I have quite a few for you here. Here are the first few answers. We have water up here. I definitely recommend that you draw water at a right angle, as well as its cousins. Here you have dihydrogen sulfide, two hydrogens and one sulfur. This will help later when we get to intermolecular forces. Um, then we have ammonia, which is the common name for nitrogen trihydride. To finish off the Lewis structures, we have carbon dioxide appearing again. We have bromine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Here in this, we have a single bond between the bromines. One electron from each atom is contributed, giving two in total. They say, I'll share one with you if you share one with me. This Lewis structure, you can plug in any of the halogens in place of bromine to get the correct answer for that Lewis structure um, because they have the same number of valence electrons. Now oxygen down here, we have um, a double bond. There are two electrons from each oxygen contributed to that double bond. So um, in total, it's four electrons, two from each oxygen. They say, I'll share two with you if you share two with me. And last, we have nitrogen with a triple bond, three electrons from each atom, totaling six. They say, I will share three with you if you share three with me. <laughs> last up, we have metallic bonding. Um, the first question, what are the properties of metals? What is metallic bonding? And then how is that different from ionic bonding? Metals are shiny, malleable. They conduct both heat and electricity. They are ductile, meaning you can easily string them out into wires. They lose electrons when they bond and they become positive ions, which we call cations. Uh, metallic bonding is when we have a chunk of metal and the electrons kind of hot potato from one atom uh, or one nuclei to the next. I refer to it as hot potato, but plenty of other people refer it as to the uh, sea of mobile electrons. Uh, valence electrons don't really belong to an atom. They belong to the sample instead. Uh, and then lastly, ionic bonding is a metal bonded to a nonmetal where you have a full transfer of electrons. And in metallic bonding, the electrons are just swimming around one to the next. There is no real ownership of that valence electron. And it only occurs in metal samples. And that's it. That's everything that I have on your bonding practice. If anything was a little weird uh, and you weren't totally clear on it, please make sure to go check out that chemical bonding playlist. Find the video that matches the question set that you were struggling with. Go back, rewatch it. Come back here with any questions you have and subscribe so you don't miss the next unit. We're going to get into intermolecular forces. Super excited to see you there. Bye.